All right. So I guess we're looking at the wrong one here. Uh, map three dash one. Okay, so have, have any of you guys uh, started some of these? I, I know uh, I know a couple of you have this rational expression stuff. If not, it's fine. Um, we'll do it now. All right, so lesson 15, rational functions. So what this is about is really functions where you got something over something, right? And as a bit of a reference here, do you remember how we took like the square root function like a while back, you know, when we were doing radicals and it looked like this, it was like a graph that did that. Well, and then, and then we did transformations to it, right? We said, okay, well this thing might be, you know, shifted five to the right and it might be stretched. And, and we did all that with radical functions, right? We got the same type of thing happening now, but now we're going to do it with the uh, rational functions. So the base rational function that we're going to deal with is this one. It's going to be f of x is equal to 1 over x. The same way that the base function that we were dealing with before would have been f of x is equal to the square root of x, right? This is just kind of where we're starting. But then we can kind of look at doing transformations just based on that, on that one, right? Like how does this thing shift around? So let's, let's look at this thing for a second just to get our bearings here, just to see how this graph even makes sense of 1 over x. Well, we end up with an asymptote right up and down. Um, okay. Here. Okay. So we end up with an asymptote straight up and down. Um, and that asymptote, right, that would be the line right there, right, straight up and down. Well, where does that come from? You guys probably remember that it's the number that you're dividing by, right? Because like, what number can you never divide by? You can never divide by zero, right? That's like the only number. So you, you can't take the square root of a negative and you can't divide by zero. So in this case, right, if X was equal to zero, then I've now got one divided by zero and that can't happen. And that's what creates that asymptote, right? You, it just can't happen. But you can see if I threw some numbers in here for a second, and I think this is worth doing, some different numbers for X. Let's say we had F of one. So here, if we had F of X is equal to one over X, and then I say, okay, what is F of one? Meaning when I put one in for X, right? When I put the number one in for X, well, that would look like this. So it'd be one over one. Okay, well, the, the point one over one, that really is, That'd be f of one is equal to one, right? So when x is one, y is one. Well, that's that point right there, right? That's, that's always going to be on the graph of one over x, right? It's always going to be one, one. Another really helpful point here is going to be this one down here. It'll be this point. And let's see if this makes sense. So this would be if we had f of negative one, right? When x is negative one, that would be one over negative one. So that would be f of negative one is equal to negative one, right? So that is that point, right? So that's where those two points come from. And we could keep doing this all day long, putting all the points in. We could say, okay, when, let's just throw one in here for a second, it, or two, I guess. I mean. So if I said f of two and see what we get out, well, that would be equal to one over two. That would be a half. And if I put in three, that would be one over three. So that'd be a third and that's that point and all the way down, right? But if I go the other way, if I end up putting, if I end up putting, let's say F of a half, you know, like, so right here or 0 0.5, then that would be one over one half. And you guys probably remember, I've said this a lot. If you divide by a fraction, that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. That would be the same thing as saying, one times two over one, which would be two, right? So that's where this comes from. If I'm at a half, then this point right here, that'd be at two and so on. So, and you can see that as this number gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? If I, if I take a number like really, 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 really close to zero there, right? That would be 
that would be equal to one over some very, very like 0 0.00000001, right? You can see that 0 0.00000001 is gonna go into one a lot of times. That's gonna give me a giant number. Well, that's why this line starts to go higher and higher and higher, but it never does give you, it never does give you um, infinity, right? Or you never can do it. You never can take the square root of zero, so it never does work there. That kind of makes sense. Give me a thumbs up of that if you're following along there. Cool. All right. Now the other side of the equation would just be the same thing. So if I had, let's say the point, let's say the point negative a half. So F of negative one half is equal to, well, that would be one over negative a half. So that'd be the same thing as negative two. Well, that's this point here, negative two. So it, then it's going to get just more and more negative as you go up and up and up. And, and something similar would happen this way too. So that's all the graph of F. I, th I think it was worth going through that because it, it can be a little confusing sometimes, but okay. So now, so now yeah, let's fill this in. So uh, non-permissible values, that would be X cannot be equal to zero. Your asymptotes, you've got a vertical asymptote. I'm just going to say VA. Um, at x is equal to zero. We haven't really talked about that one yet, but I'll, I'll talk more about that in a bit. You've got, so that was this line, right? So the line, like, a, sorry, not that, actually, sorry, not that one, maybe this line straight up and down would be a vertical asymptote. And you've got a horizontal, that's the one we haven't talked about, horizontal asymptote at, at y is equal to zero. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll explain that here in a minute too. Uh, domain and range. Um, yeah, that was really just X cannot be equal to zero. Um, key exact points. What they're talking about there would just be points on this graph. That would be the same would be that they're going to be key for us to look for to kind of like do transformations to this thing are going to be the points one, one and the points negative one, negative one, right? These points, this one and this one. Those are going to be important because those are the ones we're going to use to like move this thing around. All right. So now this one says sketch the graph of four over X. So identify the characteristics of the graph, including description of the transformation from the graph. Yeah. The, yeah, the uh, so non-permissible values, the end behavior of the function, uh, round all non-permissible values as well as uh, the end behavior. All right. So in this one, let's start off. So we've got Y is equal to four, X is the way it was written, right? Okay, well, just for a second, I'm gonna write this a little bit different so we can kind of see what we're dealing with. Um, let's write this as Y is equal to four times one over X. Are you guys good with that move? Like just sliding the four just out front? This will make a bit more sense for us now because this is really like what we've been dealing with, right? This might as well say the same thing as y is equal to 4 f of x, right? And this is just a transformation. Can you guys see that this 4 out front, that's really, gonna, that's really saying that this is going to be a, a uh, vertical stretch of 4, right? And when it's out front of the function like that. So that just means that we've got our typical function, just our normal function, but every part of this function is going to be stretched by 4, right? On, along the y, right? The vertical stretch is going to be 4. So, so we can see from this that we just have a vertical stretch of four, okay? And to maybe make sense of this, I know to begin with that just the base function, y is equal to one over x would be this, right? Where the one we just did with horizontal asymptotes that are usually drawn as dotted lines. And I also know that that graph starts at the point, I'm gonna zoom in a bit here, Starts at the point one, one, goes up like this, and then down like that, and on the other side to be similar. Better than that next time, but okay, so that, that's the general idea. Now, this whole thing is just being stretched for. So really what that means here is that this point right here, this one, one, well, that point right now is y is equal to one. So the y value is going to be stretched up four. So that's going to get stretched up to this point, right? That's going to go up four, right? Or not up four. It's going to be multiplied by four. So that's going to be at point four now. 
And then same thing down here. This one is going to be this negative one, right? Y is equal to negative one will be multiplied by four. So now that point will be down there. Yeah. So here times four, I should say times four. Okay. So now we can, we can just uh, sketch this guy out. This thing would look something like this. We'll go down there and then something like that. We don't know exactly, you know, all the points that would go through, but it's pretty good for, for what we're, for what we're doing right now. Does that make sense? Ish. Okay. Now, okay. End behavior. Yeah, let's do that. It'll probably be worth it. So, um, we can say, um, One, one way of writing it you can say as x approaches and you haven't seen this before but as x approaches zero and then this little symbol up top with a little plus sign above the zero this means as x approaches zero from the right so from the right side so it's saying as x approaches zero from this side like moving in then y approaches infinity does that make sense? So as, as, we, as we get closer and closer towards X, Y keeps getting closer and closer to infinity. It keeps going up and up and up. So we'd say that that was one of the, the things we're noticing. The other one would be as X approaches infinity. All right, so as X goes farther and farther to the right, then Y approaches zero. It gets closer and closer to zero, but never touches zero. It never actually gets to zero. The other one could be as X approaches zero from the left. So a little negative sign above it. Then what, what's Y doing? Well, Y is getting closer and closer or closer, but it's going toward negative infinity. That's going down and down and down, right? It's going farther and farther that way. And then lastly, let's say as X approaches negative infinity. So going as far as it can to the left, then y is approaching zero. All of this stuff that like that we're doing right here, we don't do too much in math thirty one. Do quite a lot in phys in uh, in calculus. So math thirty one. But I think it's worth worth showing you. Um, yeah. So here, this last one. Let's go. The domain of this guy would be x cannot equal zero, and the range would be y cannot equal zero. And that's really just because that's where our asymptotes are. And again, I still haven't gotten to the gist of uh, why we are horizontal asymptotes at zero, but I, I will explain that here in a second. All right, this one. So now sketch the graph of the function y is equal to six, uh, six over x minus two minus three. All right, so this guy, what we're doing here is, well, first off, let's figure, look, figure out looking at this. Let's compare this function to the base function of y is equal to one over x, right? That's what I want to compare it to. And then we're going to do the same things we've been doing. We're going to figure out like, you know, stretch factor, vertical translation, all that kind of stuff, right? So let's compare it to that. And let's figure out what we're dealing with. So we, again, I'm going to write this a little different. This would be the same thing as, as six times one over x minus two uh, minus three. Okay. So now, just so you can kind of see the similarity here, this would be the same type of thing as this. This would be y is equal to six f of x minus two minus three. Do you guys see that like, as a general function, that's what's going on there? I know that that's a little bit confusing, but like this is my function, right? Like, that's my function right there, one over X minus two. So in this form, you, you can see that I've got a, a vertical stretch of six and this negative two that's attached to the X down there, right? That's going to be saying, so here it's right down. I've got a vertical stretch of six. I've got a um, horizontal translation of two to the right. So two right. 
And I've got a, that three would be a vertical translation of three down. Okay, so now, typically, we get our list of data there and we'd say, okay, SRT, right? We wanna do stretches, uh, reflections, and then uh, translations. The only thing here is this, this will be a lot easier if I actually do the trans, translations first. And the only reason that we're able to get away with this is because the center is not gonna be affected, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move our asymptote, right? So here's our base function is right across, it's right at zero and zero, right? What I'm gonna do, it's like a crosshair. This is like a target, right? I'm gonna move that one with translations first and then do the stretches. And the reason I can do that is because the point zero, zero, zero multiplied by, by anything is still zero. So it's not actually affecting my middle anyway. So it's only with rational expressions that we can get away with this, but it will make our life a lot easier doing it this way. So. We're gonna, we're gonna do the translations first. Okay, so if we're doing the translations first, this thing needs to move two to the right and then three down. So what we can do here is go two to the right. So I can go, all right, so two to the right and three down. That's like my new crosshair. So here's gonna, gonna be where this thing moves around. So that's my, that's my new point. So now typically um, this thing would, it would be, so if this is my crosshair right at the center, there would be a point there and there would be a point there. And you know, it would, it would do its typical shape, but that point, right? That point is going to be multiplied by six, right? So that point that was at like one, one right there will be moving up six from there. It's going to be at, um, so one, two, three, four, five, six. So I, I can treat this like it's one, or you could go like, you could do it the other way around too and say, okay, I'm at negative. Um, oh, actually, no, that wouldn't work. Yeah. So you have to do it that way. So go up, just looking at the green at my green uh, crosshairs there and then multiply it by six and go up and then the same thing on the bottom. So this would be one, two, three, four, five, six right there. So that's where that point would be now. So this thing would do something like, like that, right? And it would never touch that asymptote going across there. And then same with this one. So it'll go, go off in that direction. <clears throat> now, if you were on, if you, like I drew this and that can get a little confusing sometimes, you can get lost in the drawings. I want you guys to remember that you can always do your mapping notation too. So we could have done this and said, okay, any point X, Y would turn into, and then just do these things. So we can say, okay, well, so this would be X um, plus two comma, and then six Y minus three. So I could take any point from the original function, just one over X and and apply this to it, and that'll tell me where the new point will be. So that'll always work, including actually uh, the point zero, zero. That'll, that'll actually also work, and that'll kind of help you get your bearings, right? So you could put the point zero, zero into this to figure out, okay, my crosshair was there, and then you could actually put that into here too, right? That would get, get you zero plus two, and then six times zero minus three, that new point is going to be right where our crosshair was. That's going to be at the point two comma negative three. So I find this one helpful, but okay, moving on. All right. So this guy, so we'll finally talk about uh, horizontal asymptotes now. So in the other video, like on the one on my website, the way it's explained, I, I find quite confusing. I'm going, to tell, I'm going to show you guys like a pretty simple way of doing this. It's, it's the more calculus way of doing it. Um, where it says, so graph this function, identify any asymptotes and intercepts. So first off, I can tell from looking at this thing that I am not allowed to divide by zero, right? 
So this right there, that's telling me something. That's telling me that I have a vertical asymptote at x is equal to two. All right, and remember x, x is equal to means it's a straight up and down line. So I can draw that in right now. Let's make a, a, a vertical line at the point two. All right, so that's gonna be my horizontal asymptote. Now, I'd like to figure out where my vertical asymptote is here, right? Well, the way we can do this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna simplify this up a little bit. Um, if, well here, let's do this first. So if I had, let, let's say I just change this up and let's say I had four X over X, right? Would you guys be okay with saying that those X's would cancel and I'd end up with four, right? We're, we're pretty much gonna do that. But what we can imagine here is that if I went, cause I'm, I'm talking about like, you know, like we're gonna have, here, I'm gonna tell you where it is here, just for the sake of simplicity. We're gonna have a horizontal asymptote at four. And what we're saying here is that as, and here this graph would look something like this. And like, like this in the end. But what we're saying is that as I go farther and farther this way, right? As X goes toward infinity. So X is getting like farther and farther. It's getting closer and closer to infinity. They're saying, what is Y equal to? Well, what the idea here though is, is that if I look at this, at my, my function here and say, okay, as my numbers are getting farther and farther to infinity, so X keeps, like I have infinity there, right? That's infinity and that's infinity or very close to infinity, right? It's going farther as far as, as, as it can. Then what ends up happening is that this, this change on the end, like minus five and minus two, compared to infinity mean diddly squat. They don't, they don't really change anything, right? So I can really almost assume that this is just four X over X, right? Like, and then the infinities, right? This would be like four infinity and another infinity would cancel and I end up with just four. So I know that's a weird like abstract um, um, thing to think about, but yeah, that's what it means is as I go like farther and farther this way, going infinitely far to the right, then what my Y ends up approaching and never getting to would be that number four, right? It's, it's, it's approaching four. So here's how this is gonna work, is that that will be the case when you're dealing with a function where your X's, the exponents on your X's are the same. So this is like X to the one and X to the one. So this is like infinity over infinity. So they're, the, they're talking the same thing, they're the same number. So that would always just be the number out front. So for example, for another example, just, you don't have to write this down, but if I had, let's say three X squared plus two X minus four, and I had like four X squared plus three, then what I get to do is I get to just ignore everything behind it because it's these squares, right? Like infinity squared makes everything so much bigger than even, even the X in the back. Like I can ignore that too. So then in the end, this is like infinity over infinity. All that really ends up happening is I get the ratio of the number out front. So this one, if, if that was my, 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 uh, my uh, function I was dealing with, then you'd have a horizontal asymptote at three over four. So it's just the numbers out front. Like I talked a lot there, but like it's really, like once you get the hang of it, it's really easy to, to do. Um, like for example, if I had, you know, five X, squared plus two over three X squared minus five. I've got a horizontal asymptote at five over three. Okay. Now that's not, that's not always the case, right? Like it, like the other ones we were doing, we had one over X, right? And you can remember that that was at the point like that one had a horizontal asymptote at zero. But that kind of makes sense because if I, if I put like infinity into this or some really large number, here, I'll put that back, one over like this really, really, really big number, then that is going to get me closer and closer to zero, right? Like one divided by a giant number gets really, really close to zero, but never gets there. So hopefully that makes sense. So it would, it would be zero. So in that case, it would also be zero. If the number up top, if I had like X, you know, three X over four X squared, that's also going to be zero because the number on the bottom is going to be getting so much bigger than the number on the top. As I get closer and closer to infinity. 
Now the other case, the last case would be this. If I had like three X squared over, uh, over two or even two X where the, the exponent is bigger on the top, that one is actually never go going to have an exponent that those ones do weird things. They, they end up kind of looking like, like this, like they do weird stuff. They never do actually end up having like a, a like an actual horizontal asymptote, but yeah, we'll, we'll we can practice those. But anyway, <laughs> talked a lot there, but so anyway, so this horizontal asymptote or so horizontal asymptote at uh, y is equal to four. So all that being said, it was just a number out front, right? Just four over one or four. Okay. So now what else can we do here? So we can say, yeah, that's pretty much the gist of it. Um, so we got our horizontal last and totes. Yeah. So, so for that one, guys, I'm going to leave it at that. We just kind of go from there. And then you could really just put some points in from there. And we know it's going to be, you know, something like, yeah. I'm not going to even get in. What I'm, what I'm getting at here is that we could have done like a funky way rearranging this where we end up with 3 over x minus 2 plus 4. And we can tell from that, like I'm not even going to get into like how we get to that. Um, but it's just because I think it's it's needlessly confusing. But from that, we could tell what the stretch factor was and what the uh, horizontal or what the uh, um, horizontal translation and the vertical translation was. But I'm not going to really get into that one. So from there, you could just actually put some numbers in for x and figure out where they went on your graph, right? So if I put in the number one in the top and number one in the bottom, that would tell me at the point one where that was. So anyway, I'll, I'll move on from that one for the, the sake of time here. Okay. Okay, so now we've got the graph of one over X squared. So that changes things up a little bit where now they're actually both on the top, but this one actually kind of makes sense, right? If I start throwing some numbers in for X, then can you guys see that no matter what numbers I put in for X, even if I put in like negative two, right? Like one over negative two squared. Well, that's going to come out as positive one over four. So positive one over four. So that'd be that point right there. So it's always going to be positive. So whether X is negative or positive, the Y is going to come out positive in the end. Cause when you square numbers, you always end up getting the positive version of it. Okay. So that's pretty much all that was. Um, yep. Okay, let's, let's look at this one though. So if I've got this function here, let's, uh, let's rewrite this a little different. It says describe the transformations that were applied to this. Well, I can rewrite this as, well, let's factor it. and say this is three over X minus five times X minus five. And X minus five times X minus five, that could be rewritten as F of X is equal to three over X minus five squared. So now that it's written like that, I can compare it to the one they wanted me to, right? They were saying compare it to y is equal to one over x squared. Well, this kind of looks like it, right? Like this is like my x is in there. And I've, instead of a one, I've got a three, but those are my transformations, right? I can see from this guy that we have a vertical stretch of three, right? That's just that three is up top, but I could have brought it out front, right? Like I was doing in the other ones. So vertical stretch of three. And I have a uh, horizontal translation of five to the right. So that that pretty much be it. So we'll go vertical stretch of three, five to the right. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna move five to the right first with my asymptote. So I'm gonna go yeah one two three four five. So that's my new asymptote there. And the point that would have been right here is going to be multiplied by three. So now that one's up here and it'd be the same on that side. So now I'm going to be up there. So this graph would just do something like that. Yes. 
Oh, yeah. All right, looking at, looking at this guy, let's rearrange that one so it looks a little bit better so we can figure out what transformations were applied. I'm going to rewrite that as h of x is equal to negative 1 over x plus 4 squared plus 2. I think I just put the 2 on the other side of this thing just so it looked more like what I'm used to. Okay, now I can see from here what, what's been done. So this thing has a uh, this thing has a vertical reflection or just a reflection uh, in the x-axis. And I know that because of the negative sign right on the front. That's the same thing as saying like y is equal to negative f of x. Right? It's like the negative is, is attached to the y there, so it's flipping it over the y-axis. Okay, so I gotta flip this thing. What else do I got? So this thing has a horizontal translation of four left, right? So opposite of that sign, so it's going to the left. And then it has a vertical translation of two up. Okay. So let's do, I like doing our point, our, our center first. So let's go, let's move this thing four left. So it's going to go one, two, three, four, and then two up. So that's my new crosshair. So I'll make my dotted lines there to know that those are my asymptotes now. Okay. And then it's being flipped, right? So typically this thing would have passed through, I like that different color. It would have passed through, you know, one, one on either side, right? Like negative one, one and one, one. And it would have done, you know, that and gone that way. But this thing has reflected over the X axis. So it's really, it's really down here now, right? Like that blue maybe. So it's really down here now, right? So our graph is doing the same thing, but it's upside down. So it's going to be more like this. And then like that. So it's, that, it's the blue one there it was, would be our final graph. Okay. Now, one thing, let's just kind of review here too. Like what if I asked us to find like our y-intercept on this guy now? Well, it's just like we've done these types of things in the past. Let's, let's do it for good measure here. We could find our y-intercept. And where is the y-intercept? Well, that's where x is equal to zero, right? So let's do that. We'll say, okay, well, y is equal to, and then negative one over zero plus four squared plus two. And I'm not even sure what that is. So we'll go negative one. So I can see if you just plug in, plug in all that in, we get y is equal to 1.9. So for our y-intercept, that would be here, right? So that would be at 1.9. It even kind of looks like it's at 1.9. So that'd be 0, comma 1.9. Okay. Now the x-intercept, if we need them. Our x-intercept is when y is equal to zero. So, okay, we'll say zero is equal to negative one over x plus four squared plus two. Okay, well, we got a little bit of math to do here, just rearranging. I'm gonna bring the two over first, so I'm gonna subtract two from both sides. So we get negative two is equal to negative one over x plus four squared. Now I'm not a big fan of having my x squared down at the bottom. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring that up over here. So we got negative two times x plus four squared is equal to negative one. And now I want to kind of get it ready to take the square root of it, right? But I'm not a big fan of this negative two. So I'm going to divide both sides by negative two. 
So we've got x plus 4 squared equals a half. And now we're ready. Now we're going to take the square root of both sides. So square root, square root. So we get x plus 4 is equal to, and just, just for the sake of simplicity right now, I'm actually just going to take the square root of negative, or take the square root of a half. So square root of a half is 0 0.707. But the square root, square root of a half is actually positive or negative, right? So we actually have to do both. So it's, there's going to be situation one and situation two here. So this is going to be one of them. And the other one would be x plus 4 is equal to negative 0 0.707. So I have to solve it twice now, right? So we'll say, okay, minus 4, minus 4. Get rid of that, minus 4. So one of our answers is x is equal to negative 3.3, we'll say. And the other one would be... Um, so negative, so point, oh, negative that minus four. So then we get X is equal to negative 4.7. Solving that one. Check to make sure that makes sense. And it does seem to make sense. You know, I drew it a little funny. It should have been through there. And yeah, so it should be good. Phew, that was a lot, eh? <laughs> We're not even done. All right, so you've got a mobile phone service provider offers uh, several different prepaid plans. One of the plans has a $10 monthly fee at a rate of 10 cents per text message uh, sent or minute of talk time. So either one of those would give you, would be 10 cents. Another plan has a monthly fee of $5 and a rate of 15 cents per text message sent or minute of talk time. So talk time is billed per whole minute. Now it says represent the average cost per text or minute of each uh, plan with a rational function. All right, so what does this all mean? Well, here, let's, to get our bearings here, let's figure out just how much it would cost in total for each of these plans. And, and this is just setting up a, uh, a uh, linear equation. So we'd say the cost of the first one, so C1, would be equal to our $10 plus, and then it's 10 cents, so 0 0.1, uh, times every thing sent, so text message or minute of talk time, so N just re represents either one of those. Okay, so that would typically be it, but that would be my total cost. But now what they've introduced here, they say uh, represent the average cost per text or minute of talk time, uh, where it says average. So this is kind of a tricky one. It says, what, what's the average cost per text or minute of talk time? Okay, so the way we'd handle this is that if this would be my total, right? If I want to find the average of anything, right? If I had like a total of like, let's say, you know, 60 minutes or something, and I did, uh, you know, 50 calls, then what I would just do is go 60 minutes divided by the number of calls. That would tell me how much I did per call right? That would just tell me how much it was per individual one. So we're going to do something similar down here. And we're just going to say it's all of this over N. So there's my equation for the first one. Okay. So now here's my equation for the second one. Be similar. C2 is going to be five plus, and then it was 15 cents. So 0 0.15 times N over N. All right, so now it just says graph it. So you just graph it in your calculator and you should end up with something that looks like so. So it would go, um, where's 100 here? I know where they cross, so it'd be 24. So be around here. They, so the one comes down and goes like so. And the other one would come like below it They'd cross and then it goes above on that side and your two lines would cross here. So the blue one, the blue one would have been C1 and the red one would have been C2. 
And where they cross is at the point 100 comma 0 0.2. Okay, so what they're saying is, so now they're saying, uh, what do the graphs show about the average uh, cost per text or minute for these two plans as the number of texts uh, and minutes changes? So for both of them, they go down, like the, the average for every individual, like one text or one minute of plan, um, gets less and less and less as you call more and more and more. And really the reason for that is because like, this initial $10 or this initial $5 starts to mean less and less after I've already spent a whole bunch of money or after I've called a whole bunch of times, right? So the end of any average uh, text or call, that just goes down quite a lot as you move forward, right? But so, so that's, what, that's what that means. Now it says, which plan is a better choice? Well, you can see that it's gonna depend, right? So if, if I talk quite a lot, right? If I talk um, over, or do a hundred different uh, uh, texts or minutes of call, then that's gonna be my breakoff point. So if I have less than that, then it looks like the second plan would have been better. But if I do more than that, if I, if I text or, or call a lot, then it looks like the first plan would have been better. All right, so it kind of depends on what you're actually planning on doing. Okay, so that's it. So I, I've been talking a long time, so I'll, I'll end it there. Uh, here, I'll just end the recording.